you know, soft drinks and big gulps and that sort of thing. And so some of these countries actually went to the United States at the U United Nations and said, could you please get your these companies that come from the US out of our country, you were destroying the health of our population because what they noticed was this sharp increase in obesity, diabetes, and all the complications, the same sorts of curves that we deal with in the US and other westernized um, countries. And the US went, well, hey, um, it's like a free market economy. We're the United States. We can't really do anything. You're on your own. And because of that, uh, researchers at the University of Brazil in Sao Paulo looked at food in a whole new way. And they classified food, not the way you still hear in the United States, like, is this meat? Is this plant? Is this, uh, you know, what's the percent sat fat? Um, you know, how much protein does it have? Is it a carb? Is it, you know, this, that, or the other? They simply looked and said, you know, is it raw and natural all the way up? And they made four classifications. And the fourth classification was ultra processed food. That's the Nova classification of food. And what they showed in their research, which has been duplicated in many countries around the world, is there's this incredible correlation between consumption of ultra processed food or level four, uh, according to the NOVA classification, and your risk of having diseases, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, depression, you know, et cetera. And um, that is so powerful a, and so well-documented correlation, the NOVA classification has actually been adopted by the United Nations. Yet for obvious reasons, um, I think you could probably guess, here in the United States, we don't even talk about it. We refuse to shift our perspective and look at food in that way. And um, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, there's actually an emerging branch of psychology called nutritional psychology because we're, we're finding out that when we can get people off this addictive sugar, fat, salt-based modern Western diet with all the ultra processing, particularly a lot of these additives that we reduce um, you know, veterans suffering from PTSD, we reduce depressive episodes, et cetera. And um, you know, one of the things we just don't talk about in medicine is how intricately our mental state, our emotions, and our physical state are linked together. Aaron and I have talked before that um, you know depression is as powerful a predictor for heart disease, for having a heart attack, as any cholesterol level. But you know your doctor, because there are certain pressures on it, on medical personnel, including time as well as other things. You know I can measure a cholesterol level. I can give you a pill. I can send you out of my office. We don't work to make people happy, yet that is as powerful as all the pharma adverts you see on TV. And, and so this to me is where um, culinary medicine, looking at all these aspects, really what we wanna do is change this whole way that we look at food. What's great about talking with you guys is, is you, are, you get it. Um, I'm talking, you know, I'm preaching to, I feel sometimes I'm preaching to the choir you know, you guys get it. You understand that food experience. You have to realize you're special. Um, you're unique. Most of the people don't, you know, they'll come into your restaurant for, and they'll have that food experience. And then they're stuffing a Cinnabon the size of their head, you know, in, well, I guess we don't go in the airport anymore, but wherever one sits at a computer now and does a Zoom meeting <laughs> um, sort of thing. So these are incredibly, um, you know, it's incredibly important for us and, and what we focus on in culinary medicine is trying to give people the tools and the knowledge base to shift that perspective. Practically in doing culinary medicine, it's what you guys do. I mean, you guys are the practical culinary medicine leaders. You already have all those skills, right? You know, it's, it's about making a stock um, instead of paying a celebrity chef, um, no, no offense intended if anybody has their, their stuff out there. Um, but paying a celebrity chef, you know, $15 for a quart of, of stock. I mean, that's ridiculous. So, um, so anyway, so Giselle, thank you for that, that question and, and that insight uh, because you're exactly right that there is that negative correlation as well as the positive correlation. And, you know, um, our relationship with food, I believe, we're all human beings, we're social primates. So our relationship with food 
that ability that you all have, um, not only because it's, it's probably a special relationship with, for you, but the ability to convey, share, and introduce that to other people is critical because if you look at the, the data from Blue Zones, um, which is a, a study done by the National Geographic Society. If you look at the Harvard Happiness Study, uh, which is a longitudinal study of, of over 70 years now, and they ask some very simple questions. What are the things in people's lives? What are the variables that correlate with people being healthy, being well, uh, main, living a long time and maintaining functionality, including cognitive functionality, and being happy with their lives? And what comes out of that is it's not a cholesterol level. It's not how much money you make actually above a certain amount. Uh, once you're past middle class, you, it doesn't matter if, if you're Bill Gates, um, you know, or, or not, uh, it doesn't matter what car you drive. Um, what it really matters is the quality, not the, not the Facebook lives, not the quantity, but the quality of the relationships in your lives. And to me, that all starts as a template um, with our relationship with food. Uh, it, it's the most fundamental one. Um, I'll, I'll just end on this note, which is, you know, the way I, I look at how we've evolved, our digestive tracts have evolved, how human society has evolved. And it all comes down to the reason we have a society is because somebody from our tribe of chefs, like 250,000 years ago, decided to, you know, grill the mastodon ribs, you know, around a campfire and, and share it with, you know, the other folks sitting around the campfire. And, and that's humanity. Uh, those are social primates. Um, that's where it came from. And, and that comes out of, um, it's sort of hinted at, if you haven't read it, a great book by the Harvard uh, anthropologist, Richard Wrangham called Catching Fire, where he talks about how the discovery of fire and cooking food is why we're here today.